And so before we dive into God's word, let's just have another moment of prayer and gather our thoughts. Father, today we pray that as we open up your word, that the only voice we hear this morning is not mine, but it's your spirit speaking to our hearts. Father, show us who you are. Reveal yourself to us this morning. Open our eyes. Open the areas of our heart that have been blind to you so we could see your beauty, so we could see your majesty, and that your name will be lifted high above all. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. So we are continuing our series called Unsinkable this morning. And churches all across South Florida have joined together to do this series. And all of us have a goal for this series, and it's to strengthen the people that come to each of our churches week after week after week. And for us, we're sitting back as Church United, as churches all across South Florida saying, how can we take the 3% of the people in South Florida that call themselves Christians, how can we move the needle from 3% of believers to 6% of believers? And churches all across South Florida have said the way that we can do that is if we strengthen the faith and the foundation of those that attend our services each and every single week. Because if you can get a firm foundation in who God is and what he can do in your life, you can become unsinkable in your faith. So no matter what storms come your way, your faith in God will never waver. And so we have united across South Florida to do this series called Unsinkable. And so we live in a culture today that is all about self, is it not? Everything you see on the TV shows to commercials, it's all about how you can help yourself out. From an early age, I remember being told myself, you can be whatever you want to be. What do you want to be when you grow up? You can be whatever you want to as long as you work hard enough, you invest in yourself, you go to college and you get a college education. If you just believe in yourself, you can accomplish your dreams and succeed at anything in life. All you need to do is take control of your own life, right? How many times do you see infomercials selling some new system Take your real estate business into your own hands. Buy my $400 program and you could be a realtor just like me. We have this idea that if I just pour enough into myself, I can accomplish great things in this world. Not only is this idea prevalent, but here's here's the thing for you. The self-help book industry. I don't know if you guys realize how big this industry is. The market research is predicting by the year 2022, that industry will be worth $13.2 billion. There is literally a self-help book for all areas of your life. How to have better yoga meditation in five easy steps. How to have a better life now. Do these three principles and you will be successful in life. And what's the idea behind all these books? The idea behind all these books is you are in in control of your own life. You get to decide how this world works, how this world operates. You take the world by the reins, and you are the center of the universe. You can become unsinkable by your own strength, power, and your will. Do you guys see this too in our society, or is it just me? You with me here? Okay, now, we've taken that on as a society. And as a result, here's what I see happening in our society. God is no longer necessary. Or, God has become irrelevant. He's too far away, and he doesn't care about the small details of my everyday life. Or, God is an angry God that is not worthy for me to believe in him anyways. Or, God didn't show up when I needed him to, so he's obviously not a good God I don't need them. Or some in our society will say, God doesn't even exist. I am what life is about. And as long as I do me, everything in this world will be okay. And church, some of us in this room might have had some of these same thoughts at some point in time in our life. Maybe some of us this morning have these thoughts where we sit back and say, what is this whole idea about God? Who is this God? What does he look like, and what is this God's purpose in my life, and how do I fit into the purposes of God? And this is why it's important for us this morning. We're going to tackle the topic of God. 
And when we talk about God, everything hangs in the balance. Because at the end of the day, every life has to make a decision on what they do with God. Do I believe in this God and believe in him as the center of the universe? Or do I choose to remain in charge of my own life and walk my own path separated away from God? And how you answer that question and make that decision determines the choices you will make in life and the path that you will be on in life. One that's following God or one that's following your own path. And both of those have consequences in your life. You see, I know that this is a difficult topic for many people. Here I am, Brad, a human, trying to describe an all-powerful, glorious, amazing, majestic, grand God, and I'm using human words to try to describe this God to you today. What I'm not going to do today is to provide physical evidence. I can't do that. And so if you're sitting back saying, oh, Brad's going to prove to me beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is real. No, Brad is not. Only God can convince you of his presence, his goodness, his character, and his worth. My goal today is to open up his truth, which Pastor Brian talked about last week. There is truth in the world, and it's found in Jesus Christ, and it's found in his word. It's grounded here. So today, my goal is to open this up, the truth, and show you who God is based upon what God's word says, not what I say. And so this morning, I, here's what we're going to unpack. We're going to see that we are not the center of the universe. God is. God is God, and I am not. So I wrote it down in my notes this way. You can write it in your notes this way. God is. I am not. God is, I am not. And so this morning, we're going to be in Acts chapter 17. And so if you turn there with me, we're going to look at the, this verse 16 in chapter 17. If you don't have your Bible, it'll also be up for you on the screens as well. And so Acts 17, 16, to set some context for where we're going to really dive into in just a moment, this is what the writer Luke says. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens... His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of what? Idols. Paul was living in Athens at this time, or visiting Athens at this time. And Athens was a very religious society, known for its religious temples, known for its religious symbols. There was idols of so many different kinds. And it was also a society that was known for its lovely philosophical debates. Luke sarcastically says later in this chapter that all they did was just sit around and talk about new ideas. And for us, we might think about it, that's not really that big of a deal. But back then, to say somebody had a new idea meant that their idea was the worst. Because what mattered the most was the old ideas, the ways that the people used to think about the way the world worked. If you had an old idea, you were smart. If you had a new idea, eh, not so smart. And so here Paul comes into the city of Athens and he looks around at all the religious temples, looks at all the symbols, looks at all the altars and realizes this society is not worshiping the true living God. They're all blinded to the truth. They're all disillusioned. They're chasing things that they think are God. They're making sacrifices to things that are not God's. And Paul is sitting back taking all of this in. And he saw a city, a society, where people who were to be made in the image of God, living out his purposes, instead have chosen the things of this world to become toys to be used by the enemy and to be used by the world for its own purpose and glory. And Paul sees a society filled with people missing out on being the true people of God. And he is moved within his spirit. He is passionate about reaching this society, saying, I have to tell them about the true living God. These people, they're blinded. What they think is worship is not true worship. I must tell them about this living God. And so it says he went into the synagogues and went into the marketplaces talking about the true living God. And the scriptures say that the people heard about this new living God 
And it was something new to them. Paul was speaking to them about a guy named Jesus who is king, who came back from the dead, resurrected, and there is faith in him, and he is king, and he is Lord. And they heard him preaching these things, and they said, you know what, Paul, we need to hear more about this God of yours. We want you to come to our Areopagus, where it's a place set up on a hill, and in the Areopagus, the people would hold public trials. They would also hold philosophical debates. Prominent people from the city and leaders would come and they say, Paul, we want to hear about your living God, this gospel about how a God became king through the person of Jesus Christ. Can you come and tell us about this God? Can you imagine the opportunity before all these prominent people willing to hear about the true living God? And in this moment, Paul goes to the Areopagus stands before the people that are gathered there that day, and he delivers a speech about this God, the true living God. And look at what he says in verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. And so we have to understand that during Paul's time, there was two major prominent philosophical thoughts of people that Paul is about to address. The first were called the Epicureans. And the Epicureans believed, yeah, there's gods. God started this whole shebang we see in the world, but they are so far away, they could care less about what's happening to your life. They're way out there in their own divine world. We're here on earth, left by ourselves, so the best that we can do to be happy in life is just to live a quiet, content life. Don't do too much. Just be content with who you are, what you have, and that is what life is all about. Then you have these people called the Stoics on the other hand, And they believed that the divine presence was everywhere in the world, can be found anywhere, and not only everywhere, but it is inside each and every single one of us. And so their goal in life was, hey, try to harness and tap into that power of the divine, and then you would have true knowledge, true life, if you could just tap into your divine self. Now, if we look back at our society today, and we see what we have, we're in a similar society. There are some that say gods are here, but they're far away and they could care less. There are some that say the divine is everywhere. God is in everything and in everyone. You yourself can become a god. The past couple decades before, our society was not as religious as it is today. There are people that are longing for a spiritual desire, a spiritual need, and our society has become super spiritual these days. Even the generations coming below us, millennials and Generation Z, they are looking for a spiritual encounter, a spiritual experience. But here Paul realizes that, yes, Athens, you're a very religious society. I see it by all all your gods. But you're looking for that religious experience everywhere else except in the true God. And then Paul comes up to the the altar to the unknown God. And the people during that time, they had so many different idols and gods that they worshipped that they said, you know, what if there was a God out there that we don't know who he is and what he's about? So we don't want to offend that God. So we're going to set up an altar and we're going to give sacrifices to that altar. That way, this unknown God, he will be appeased and he won't bring disaster upon us. And God uses that altar to the unknown God and says, you know what? I'm going to tell you about this unknown God. Because right now, you guys don't know the true living God. Because if you knew the true living God, you wouldn't worship these idols. You'd put these idols away and give your true worship and dedication and sacrifice to the one and only living God. And so he takes what is common to them and tells them, here's what I want you to know about this God. And here Paul is sitting back realizing the only way they are going to know this God is if he gives them the truth about who this God is. And not only is he going to tell them about who this God is, he's also going to tell them that this God can be known personally by everyone. It's not a God who is off, way off in space. It's a God who you can know intimately, a God you can know deeply, a God you can know in a personal relationship with him. Look at verse 24. 
And he de- begins to describe God this way. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place. Paul begins the description of God with this one phrase. He is the creator. God made heaven and earth. Not only did he make heaven and earth, he made everything that is inside of it. So all the beauty that we see in creation, the clouds, the mountains, the grass, the birds, the animals, the insects, the roaches that horrify me, all of those things, God has made all of it, the oceans, the sun, the breeze, all of these things, God has established it, he has created it, and if God has created it, guess what? He is in control of it. He is the center of the universe, and we, humanity, are not. Flies in the face of who we are as humans from the moment we're born, we're determined to live life our way. We're determined to say, we are in charge of my life. I can do whatever my heart desires because I'm in control of my life. You are not. God is the center of the universe. He created everything within this world. He is a powerful God that created this world out of nothing. But yet many times in our idea, in our life, We come up with ideas about who God is. And here's the reality. Anytime that we think of an idea about God that does not line up with Scripture, it's idolatry. Well, if God was a good God, he wouldn't allow X to happen. X happened, therefore he's not good. Idolatry. God is good. God is loving. God is gracious, God is just, God is merciful, despite your circumstances and how you think your life should play out. Anytime we think God should be different than how he's described in scripture, it's idolatry. It's a false God, it doesn't line up with who God is. God is who he is, no matter what we think about him. Well, I don't think God exists. It doesn't matter, he exists. God is who he is, no matter how you think or feel about him. And Paul wants us to catch the proper view of who God is. And we have to remember that Paul was a Jew, and not only just was a Jew, he was raised as a Pharisee, a religious leader. He knew the scriptures in and out, and he knew the scriptures that Sean read to us earlier this morning, found in Isaiah chapter 6, that this is an awe and wonder that God invokes in our heart and mind when we realize that there is no one like our God. There is no equal to God. There are no rivals to God. God is God, and I am not. And so I'm going to read to you those verses again, verses 1 through 5 in Isaiah chapter 6. Here's the first one. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. I just want to pause for a moment. The train of his robe, the back part of his robe, like the last part of his robe, filled this temple that Isaiah is seeing. What, what are we trying to grasp? That God is bigger than we could ever imagine. When we compare ourselves to this great, holy, all-powerful goal, God, we are small. We are minuscule. He is infinite. He is majestic. He is glorious beyond our comprehension in anything we could ever think about him. Look at what he says in verse two. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet and with two he flew. You see, if you guys remember the story of Moses, when God meets him in the burning bush, he tells Moses to remove his shoes. Why? For where he's standing is what? Holy ground. So here you have these angelic beings in the presence of this great God covering their face, covering their feet. Why? 
because they are in the presence of holiness, a magnitude of holiness that we can't even comprehend. And look at what they say in verse 3. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We do not have a God who is far away from us. We have a God who is near to every one of us. The moment we think God is far is because we have walked away from who God is and from him as the living God and have gone our own path. God's presence and glory fills the entire earth. And look at verse four. And the, thresh, the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And if you're like Isaiah picturing this scene, and you've been granted a privilege beyond all privileges to see this great and glorious God, he backs up and says, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah learned a powerful truth in that morning, or that day, whenever it was. God is God, and I am not. Humanity can never be God. God is on another level that we aren't even close to being. And, his, and when he shows us a glimpse of who he is, it wrecks us, it changes us, it humbles us because we realize God is great. I am not. I am aware of all my flaws. And this week I had an opportunity to do a small group with kids from the school. And it's kind of this idea that we get to. He, we were talking about how doubt creeps into our hearts and in our minds. And I, have, and I asked, have any of you ever had like a negative thought about yourself and he goes, yeah, he goes, so many times I will sit in the shower, allow the water to run over my head, and I just think, what a horrible person that I am. Like, I know all the things that I've done that are wrong. How could anyone love me? You see, that attitude is the same. We know our faults. We know that in life, that when we try to take life in our own reins and we try to be on the throne of our life, we know where we fail. And when we encounter God and how he really is, it humbles us to realize, man, I have done so many things that don't honor him, that have offended this living God. And Isaiah, like all of us, says, God is, I am not. You see, Paul declares that God does not live in a building made by human hands. God is not a God who could be sculpted by human hands out of metal, gold, silver, or wood. The reality is this, is that we can't make God in our image. The reality, the scriptures say, is that we have been created in God's image. And here Paul is saying, look guys, you can't make a house for God because he's made you. All that you are, he's given you life, he's given you breath he's given you everything that you have you can't create God it's the other way around God has created you you're in his image and not only that he's established where the nations are where people are and put them in the right timing and place and again Paul wants us to capture this truth God is the center of the universe and we are not but then Paul shifts to this amazing truth. This all-powerful, holy, righteous, just creator God says this to all of us, all of humanity. Look at verse 27. He's created them, given them life, breath, and everything in it, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from one of each of us. In him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. 
Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. What is Paul getting at? That this all-creative, powerful God is a God that each of us can know personally. That this is a God who sees every struggle you walk through. This is a God who sees the storms of your life. He sees the mistakes of your life. He sees the sins in your life. And this is a God who is reaching out to you saying, I want to know you. The scriptures say that God wills that none should perish, but that all would come to know him. His hand is out saying, I want you to know me, the true living God, where you could be put right. Yes, I know your sin. Yes, I know you're faulty. I know you're broken. I know you have mistakes, but my love is greater than your sin. Because you are created in his image, his prized creation. He created this beautiful world and everything in it to do what? To put us his people within it, to know him and to reflect his praise and glory to everyone else in the world. God has a purpose for your life, and your purpose can only be found when you find it in the true living God. You will never find it chasing life your own way, doing things your way, because every time you do it your way, you're setting yourself up for heartbreak and disaster. But on the flip side, it doesn't mean if I put my faith in God that my life is going to be unicorn and skittles. Life is going to have storms. But the beauty of being founded and rooted in Christ is that your faith will be unsinkable. That your faith in God will never waver. Yeah, my circumstances are awful. Yeah, what I'm walking through is miserable. But I am loved by a holy and just God. And if I don't have anything else, I am cool with that because I have Christ. This is why Paul could say, I know what it is to have a little. And I know what it is to have a lot. But all that matters to me is that I am known and loved by Jesus Christ. And that's where we can come through faith in the living God. And so he says to the Epicurean belief, God cares about your life so much that even the hairs on your head, he knows how many those are. He says to the Stoics, God's presence is in this entire world. He can be found. And not only can he be found, but you are yourself created in his image, even though you have all of your faults. And to everyone else, he says, put away your faulty views of who God is. Don't chase after these fake ideas about God. He's the creator of the world, he is king, he is Lord, and he desires to know you. And this morning, the same truth is for each of you. God cares about each and every single one of you in this room. You are created in his image for a reason and a purpose. And you can know this God, and he has given you life and breath. And God is, I am not. Look at verse 30 and 31. It says this, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to what? Repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will what? Judge the world in righteousness by a man, Jesus, whom he has appointed. And of this he has given us assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Paul said something super profound here. God has acted in a new way He's overlooked the ignorance of all the idolatry, all of that, and now the moment has come in the person and work of Jesus Christ. He has spoken to the entire world. He has revealed himself to the world through Jesus Christ and says, now everyone has to do something with Jesus Christ and who he is. All of us in this room We'll have to make a decision before we breathe our last or before Jesus returns. What do we do with the person of Jesus Christ? Do we put our faith, repent of our sins, and follow him? Or do we say, Jesus, I see you, but I'm going to continue life my way. And Paul says, look, God is going to judge the world. He's going to judge the world on one thing. What did you do with my son, Jesus Christ? Did you believe in him and trust him, or did you reject him? 
It's not how many times in a, on a, in a year you can come to church. It's not how many small groups you involve yourself in. It's not how many times you serve people food that are homeless. It's not how many times you sat back and, I've read the Bible ten times a week this week. I'm doing really good. It's not about those things. It all comes down to God's going to judge you based upon is your faith in Jesus Christ. Have you been saved by his grace? That's it. That's the only way to, for God to make you unsinkable. And we all have to make that choice in life. What do we do with this living God that was revealed to us? And, and Paul says, look, and Jesus is the true judge, and here's the proof. I, God raised him from the dead. And God is going to judge the world through Jesus. To be put right, to find eternal life, to find salvation, to find redemption, it's your faith in Jesus Christ. And this is the good news. Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. And in him, you can be made right through faith in him. All you have to do is believe. You see, for all of us this morning, we know that the good news is the power of salvation unto those who believe. For those of you who have placed your faith in Christ, you know that there is power in that. And this morning, when we speak this word, Jesus is King, Jesus is Lord, that's going to speak to your heart in either belief or it's going to speak to you and you can walk away saying, eh, I don't want any part of that. You see, there was a couple verses later that you can read on your own where it says that after Paul delivered this speech about the true living God, that it said some people mocked him and made fun of it. Then a verse or two later it says, but there were some of the men who believed. And this is the beauty of the gospel. We can't determine salvation for you. But we put out the good news, we put out the gospel, and then it's left to you in your heart and your mind to say, what do you do with this person, Jesus Christ? Do you believe him and trust him as he is or do life your way? I'm going to have my wife Kelly bring up to me uh, an object here. And so we've been doing this series, The Unsinkable. And this is actually a, ti a Titanic. It's a, I don't know what you call this, a model of the Titanic, right? And so I'm just going to kind of illustrate this for you. You see, from the moment that we are born, we think that life should be about what we want to do. And if you take a life that says, I don't want God in it, and Jesus, I don't want your ways, we become the Titanic. See, the thing about the Titanic is the stories about how the Titanic go is that some of the engineers and the people that were involved in building it, some say that they were calling this ship unsinkable. Then they, some people would say, oh, you know, maybe they were saying it was practically unsinkable. Regardless, they thought this ship was filled with the greatest technology. It was the fanciest boat that you could have seen at that time. I mean, it has an orchestra playing on it. It's got fancy things all over. This boat was huge. It was massive. It was unsinkable. And the story goes that even the captain, Edward Smith, made a statement, even God can't sink this ship. Now, Am I saying that God sank the ship? No, an iceberg did. <laughs> but here's what I'm trying to get at. When we live life on our own, we think that we can get our life all in ship shape. We're successful. I have a great career. I have lots of friends. I got a house. I got this. I got everything I need. I am unsinkable. I'm the Titanic. I have achieved great things. All the while realizing that God never created you to be the Titanic. Because when you're the Titanic, storms come, you hit an iceberg, and your ship sinks. I've seen so many people go through the difficulties of life and the tragedies of life and blame God. And they have this hole inside of their heart and in their soul 
that they've tried to fill by being the Titanic. And God is saying that hole, that desire that you have to be put whole, to find true worship, will never happen when you're living apart from me as the Titanic. God has created us to be like an iceberg. Statistics show that 90% of an iceberg is underneath the water. Pastor Brian alluded last week that an iceberg finds its stability not in what's above the water, but what is underneath the water, where it is rooted, where it is firm, where it is stable. 90% is under this water. And God created us to be a stable people who despite life circumstances, can still sit back and say, I have joy because I know Christ. When ships come, it might chip you, might take some of your ice blocks, but your foundation is secure. You are safe in God's hands. Storms of life can rage against you, but God is your protector. God is your refuge. God is your strength. He is the true living God who says he is the center of the universe. You are not. Put your faith in me. And so today, I very simply, here's my prayer for everyone in the room today. I pray that you choose to put your faith in the living God, Jesus Christ. He alone can right what is wrong in your life. He is the only one who can satisfy your desire for worship He is worthy of our worship. He desires to know you. He is king and he is Lord and he is God and he can make you unsinkable. And my prayer today is that your faith would be in Christ and Christ alone and that you would make that decision this morning because God is, I am not. So would you bow your hearts with me this morning? So just a moment, the worship team is going to come out and play a song for us and you have an opportunity I don't know where each of you are but if you're sitting back and you've never placed your faith in the living God today I pray would be the day that you would cry out in the quietness of your heart and say Jesus is King Jesus is Lord I believe in you and man as the leaders of our church we would love to know that that was a decision you made why so that we could celebrate with you because the scriptures say that when one person repents and turns from their way of living and turns to the living God, that all of heaven rejoices and celebrates. And we would love nothing more to celebrate what God has done in your life through putting your faith in him. For others of us, we put our faith in Christ, but some of us, we might have gone back and taken our life into our own hands. This is an opportunity for you to say, man, if there's something in my life where I've been living on the throne of my life instead of God, now's the time to confess that, turn from that, and say, God, you are on the throne. You are in control. Change me. Heal me. Forgive me. Father in heaven, we pray that your spirit will move in a mighty way in our hearts and in our minds. Father, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. And Father, even though we only see a glimpse It is extraordinary. It is life-changing. And Father, we can't wait for the day when we see you face to face. And Jesus, the sacrifice that you made to love us despite our mistakes, despite our sins, that you were willing to endure that cross so that we could know you. Jesus, we can't wait to see you face to face. And so Father, we pray that you would change hearts, save souls for your honor and for your glory. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.